John, did you guys do Emerald City once? Yeah, we have the, uh, the our Western Wizard of Oz called The Legend of Oz, The Wicked West. Wicked. I, yeah, I, I love those ones, man. Uh, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, I put, that's what got me into it. I think it was like the Penny for a Soul and they were like, okay, what else have they done? Because I'm always mm -hmm. like that. Like, what have you done? Look around and see what else and then go for that. Yeah, we've so got I'm like, so, we have like 13 different titles that we do right um and then like the, and then there's like all kinds of spin-offs like penny for your soul is the title and then we did like a joan of arc book so joan of arc yeah. has a book but that's part of the penny universe so there are like spin-offs yeah. too but um we have like 13 or so actual individual titles that we've done yeah and and that doesn't include all the weird you know special yeah, days like alien good. abduction day and stuff yeah. so uh so yeah we've, we've been busy for 14 years and yeah. Um, you know, the last eight years, it's been very different because everything we do has been through Kickstarter. So whereas yeah. we used to do like, you know, anywhere from two to five issues a month when we were going early on by ourselves, um, that slowed down when we went to Aspen because they wanted to reprint everything. And then, uh, uh, and then when we came out of Aspen, everything we did was through Kickstarter. And so we had to learn how Kickstarter worked. We right. had to figure out a time frame for this. So we were originally doing them all quarterly. So every three months you'd get an issue. Um, yeah. And then we realized that, that man, this is going to take forever. So we started to speed up the process. And occasionally we would do like double-sized issues just to get more content out quicker. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we've been we've been playing with the, with the platform now for a number of years. And we've kind of got a hang of it. And so now we still do kind of four quarterly primary campaigns throughout the right. year usually heavily focused so like we're going to do three critter campaigns this year that's our big focus but then throughout the year we'll have sort of our our little spin-off things like goth day in may the bd14 anthology in july and so on and so on and then some of our fancy days you know again as well so um we we generally every year have we have a focus on one book uh and do at least three books for that particular series and then uh and then whatever else we want to we want to throw into it and so next year uh in january we'll actually finish this critter campaign the fourth issue will finish that arc and then from there we'll be rolling into um a new penny for your soul storyline to help celebrate sure. the 15 years of penny yeah. for your soul plus all the other stuff that we're going to do you know for our for our big anniversary but this year we're going to have a lot of campaigns and so this is sort of really a a test of like what can we really accomplish? Like, what can we really handle? Yeah. Um, Cause we're not necessarily going to come out and just start doing stuff monthly, but at least every two months is probably yeah. what our future is. Um, yeah. Even if, again, if it's like a big one and a small one and a big one and a small one, like we still want to do as many of these as we can throughout the year to, to just keep putting books out. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we're seeing a, a really interesting, surge of people finding us right now um yeah. i was at a comic book store on wednesday yesterday yeah and somebody and i was just buying my books and somebody came in to that store who's a regular buyer of their stuff and they pointed them to exciting comics 41 which just came out from antarctic press and it has a catnip story that i wrote in it and um i was talking to the owners and we were just shooting the breeze and, uh, uh, you know, the guy finished his and he came up and he was just listening to us talk and talk, and talk. And he came up and it turns out this guy's an old school critter fan from back in the day. Yeah, that's the, that's the issue. So I was like, oh, dude, I mean, like we, we're still doing this. Like we just did Kickstarters. We have new issues. Like, do you know what you're missing? He's like, no, I have everything. <laughs> so he was a, a regular comic book buyer of critter from 14 years ago buying these issues. So he was super excited. I signed his book. He was like, oh, this is super cool that it's new issues. Um, he hadn't really dealt with crowdfunding before. So we kind of talked about mm. that a little bit. Like, this is how we do it. But then then Don at, at Comic Signal, he was like, well, we'll have those issues. Like he wants to, Don wants to carry the books. He's like, yeah, well, bring me the books and we'll carry them and put them in the shelf too. Um, so I'm like, that's awesome. That That's great. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a really interesting resurgence period for everything big dog ink but particularly critter because i didn't expect that at all we just wrapped yeah. the campaign last sunday uh or a week ago sunday and um 
I fully believe that we would max the campaign out at about 15,000. Like I never believed we would get past 15,000. This is probably our limit. And we screamed past that and, and landed at 20 when it was all done. I was absolutely blown away. Um, yeah. And a lot of the buyers in that, uh, and, and this is kind of counterintuitive to a lot of people that, that do Kickstarters and stuff and crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to understand this. Um, they all want their all their variant covers to sell. We had a gigantic amount of people buying trade paperbacks. I mean, like yeah. a ridiculous amount of people. And those are readers, right? Same with yeah. digital. We had a bunch of guys buying digital stuff. Those are mm -hmm. readers, man. Uh, and, and that is where your foundation has to begin yeah. because yeah. if someone's coming in because they want to buy a Bill McKay cover, that's great, but that you might not be able to have Bill on every campaign. And so if yeah. they're only there for that artist that one time, that's, that's a throwaway sale. We'll take it. Right. I'm not telling you not to do it, but it's a throwaway sale. So if we've got people that are coming in and they're buying the books to read them, like clearly, yeah. like trade paperbacks, there's no value to them. It's just the trade paperback. Yeah. That's the amazing foundation that's being built for this book now. Because once they yeah. got all those those uh, those books, then they want all the new issues. And once they're getting the new issues, then they might start to filter into some of the back, uh, some of the... Uh, uh, the variant covers like, Oh, I got it all, but I want to get something else. Like, let me, let me get this cool variant cover now. Um, so it was amazing. Been, it was a great campaign. That's been something I've been thinking about as well. It was like, not everybody is there just for the variant covers. Sure. And, and you're right. Like, because I was looking at like, well, there's, you know, I'm looking at bringing out a manga. It's going to be complete manga, right? Mm -hmm. Complete story just as a manga. So it looks like a manga. It reads like a manga and everything is a manga about it, you know, except it's written by, uh, you know, art by uh, Argentinian and um, written by me, right, mm -hmm. down here. But it's packaged in that, and it's a complete book because you don't know, you know, I mean, I might have some variant covers for those books, but I think not everybody is just coming to be the one-shot guy or one, you know, variant person. And you want them to be able to read read something and offer something for different audiences. And I think that's a cool thing about it, like because not every audience is going to be behave the same way. Like me, oh, like, totally. all I did the last two years was variant covers. That's all I did because I didn't care for the friggin' well, stories but, being told. Cool. And, and that's and that's a fair thing. I mean, art right mm -hmm. now is carrying comics. I mean, it is yeah. carrying comics. Um, yeah. And and anybody who disagrees with me you're you, you're not you don't know what you're talking about and i'm come on yeah. the show let's talk about it um yeah. art is carrying comics right now without question but that does not mean there are not still readers and yeah. the I readers mean, are the foundation and the instant you produce yeah. something that someone doesn't want to read then the yeah. character itself becomes inval uh, unvaluable unvaluable yeah. and so at that point it doesn't matter if j scott campbell comes on and drives the cover because no yeah. one cares about the character so this is what i keep trying to tell people that are coming into this business and trying to do marketing for their characters character yeah. story art in that order yeah. you have to do it that way you use the art to sell your story but if your story yeah. is junk th there's only so long you can sell covers if no one cares mm -hmm. about the character that's that's a big oh. problem that a lot of people don't seem to grasp and the there's only so many times you can flash a pair of tits and 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 sell it if no one cares about the character yeah because a character if they i mean i will only you know i'm buying i've been buying batman only for the fact that i've loved batman forever i don't care mm -hmm. about the stories but i've loved the character and I, and you're right mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know even with with our slogan like our com um, our stories our way that's been our thing since i started the company mm -hmm. right with plunge enterprises it was it like our stories it's, it's our stories it's not our art it's not that it's about our stories but done our way and i think if you know if you're in the business of telling stories then you know you're just an artist right well, just yeah and, and one of the other problems we have is that there's a lot of concepts right there's a lot of people that have concepts this is my idea for what this yeah. is okay cool but the execution of it often just trips over its own feet um yeah. and 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 again it's it's a similar thing I, and I won't even say, and I've I've said this publicly many times now in the last year because we went back and just republished Penny for Your Soul for the first time. Yeah. Um, after I think it was out of print for like five years, the first volume. So we did a new trade right. paperback. I went back in and remastered the whole thing. We completely relettered the whole thing. And and as I was going back in and I was reading my old scripts in order to do editing on them, mm -hmm. um, I was like, this is terrible. Like I right. was looking at my own work and going, this is terrible. How yeah. did anyone like stick with me on this? Cause this is the writing is so bad. 
conceptually though i think it was really good and yeah. the writing was good enough that people were like okay this is a little wonky but i like what's going on but it gave yeah. me time to get better and better at what i was doing right so um you know a lot of times i see people just dropping concepts like here's here's a new concept issue number one boom, yeah. and then there's no number two number three number four to follow it up to make yeah. it better like along the way so it's just like this yeah. sort of one and done thing um, and, and it's like, I'm going to do this concept. I'm going to do this concept. I'm going to do this concept, but there's no continuity to it, you know, to, to just keep getting better at your craft. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, plus it's like, Oh, Hey, didn't you do like something like last year? Isn't there a number two for that yet? Yeah. Like what, where's the rest of my story? So you kind of run into that. So I see that a lot of times guys are just like, here's the number one, here's the number one, here's the number one. And they're yeah. all just new things. Right. Uh, it's not like Polito where everything's a number one, but everything's continuity for him. So it's, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so I tell people like you are better off focusing on one thing and branding it and making it your thing like what yeah. you're known for before you start branching off into three or four or five other things just yeah. to sell another pair of tits on a cover. Um, yeah. Because again, ultimately, eventually people will be like, oh, there's not a number two. There's not another two to that one. There's not a number two to that yeah. one. Why am I here? Um, again, unless these things are built to be one shots, which that's a different thing. But yeah, people mean, in I, comics I, like continuous storytelling. They like you know, as much yeah. story as they can get, whether it's a four issue series or an ongoing or whatever. Yeah. So uh, that's one of the just pieces of advice that I give people is like, don't come in with number one superhero book. And then three months later, come in with number one horror book. And then three months later, come in with number one, whatever, focus yeah. on the one and make that one awesome and use it to build your craft. Because when you're bouncing between genres, um, it, you're, you're not focusing on, for example, superheroes, make that superhero sure. thing as superhero as you can make it and make it awesome and grow mm -hmm. your writing skills along with it. And then once you've kind of conquered that and you've done a mini series, okay, now I'm going to take what I learned. I'm going to come over to the horror world and we're going to, we're going to play around in that world and we're going to, we're right. going to see what we can do. Um, I, I think, th and that's the way that I did it. You know, even when I was doing comics just uh, through diamond uh, originally, right. it's like we had, Critter and we had Penny for Your Soul and that was it for the first year and a half, uh, and yeah. then we brought Oz on, um, and even in then it you know Penny for Your Soul was a recurring miniseries. So we would run seven, take a break, do something mm. else, and then come back to it and do another seven and so on and so on. Right. Um, so yeah, you know I I I think that that's a I think that's a huge disadvantage to to new creators who are just coming out and just throwing concepts out versus right. like. I'm going to give you this arc, this four issues. We're going to do this four issues as fast as we can without interruption. Um, right. That gets your fans involved. That gets your artists involved. That gets your own brain power and, and your own craft involved because you're trying to elevate your story as you go as well. Sure. Um, and then, and then to me, you get something when you're done, you get something better on the back end of it that you can right. then, you know, again, leapfrog from onto something else. I think it all comes down to like how many teams you got working on the books. Like, I mean, I was talking to this one guy today and uh, just before this, um, and he's, he, he worked with a couple of different artists. And so the art, you know, looked different and the mm -hmm. story you know, uh, was different. Uh, I mean, the story was the same, but the art looked different between two books. And I was, I was you know, we were trying to say, well, if you've got a six story um, art, how is it going to work when you have different artists involved in each one? It's going to look you wonky know? unless there's yeah. a reason and for it, which sometimes there's a reason. Like you can write a reason into it. Like if it's a weird fantasy yeah. thing, that works. But yeah, yeah you if, you, if like you don't have consistent you can art. Work it as like a flashback thing, right? So you could say, well, that one's a flashback story. And this is, and you could actually, you know, if you're doing a, you know, a six issue arc, you can drop those in, in a, you know, in between pages, mm -hmm. you know, another couple of pages and kind of use that as a, um, as a concept but i think it really comes down to team like what teams you have what we're doing what and also i think uh, publishers you know like small print are looking for different stories as well because they're not everybody's going to be interested in the superheroes because like super you know everybody you know in the west that kind of reads that mostly but elsewhere they don't really just read superhero stories and i think with uh 
with the advent of what's going on internationally with Netflix, with all the different stuff you can get on that, as well as in the comics industry, right? Right now, um, you know, you can have um, a variety of stuff coming out, but it all sure. depends on what teams are on what. Now, we've got here, uh, it's the same thing, like if you're like at, um, you know, like Antarctica or um, Antarctic, Antarctic or Atlanta, Atlantic. Antarctic Press, yeah, they do a lot of different Antarctic stuff. Antarctic Press. Yeah. And then Everybody does that, a lot of different um, stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, and that's so just it, what it is. yeah, because you've got different teams working on different books. So um, Ross here says there's a lot of people um, people saying creating creators, filmmakers should produce more original content characters, but there's a lot to say about developing existing ideas to get deeper into the universe. That's something that I actually said to the guy. I said, look, you, you've got six issues you got to come up with, but have you thought about what else you can do with it? You know, if you're going to come in, what's volume two? What's volume three? Because if it's just one and done, you know and what is that part of and what's the universe part of so um, because i'm like everything i do is, is ties into our you know especially with the all ages books kind of thing ties into the plunge universe so the characters are always tied there's something nuggets going on for different age readers in there but also you know we're building another universe where it's like okay we're going to do this with team plus books and then we're going to carry that on for at least 12 issues with the idea that if it really picks up after four, fourth issue, we'd just keep it going because we've got so many more ideas. I think the the whole um, like this whole thing about you know continuity is what like you look at like episodic series. Like we love episodes, right? We can watch like one next last week and one this week and one next week and next week. And I think you, the whole idea that you're saying about like continuity, it's I wonder why people think if it's it's just one shots, uh, you know, or like just. I'll tell you why. Them. I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's easy, because and this has been happening for years. Not just one shot issues, but like they'll just do like a four issue mini series and then it's done. It's because they're just pitching to Hollywood. All they're doing is right. creating concepts so that Hollywood will say, yeah. "Oh, that's a good concept. Let me let yeah. me license it. Let me option it." Right. That's it. That's yeah. that's it. They're not in it for that book. They're not in it for those characters. They're not in it for anything. And they show that because they just do it and they throw it away and they move on to the next one. Yeah. So it's it's all just what can I throw against the wall and see what sticks? And I get that. I 100% get that. But we all see that. We all know yeah. that that's what you're doing. And yeah. so that is going to hurt your sales because we all know that there's not going to be more to this. So that's not to yeah. say it's not a good concept. It's not to say you're not going to do a good job with it. But once you're done with those four issues or whatever it is, yeah. if there's no more, it drifts off into obscurity, right? Unless it was, unless it happened to be something so uh, uh, culturally significant, like a Dark Knight or a Watchmen, yeah. you know, something like that. Unless you create something, and and really, in that case, that's just Batman, right? I mean, they just modified yeah. Batman, so Batman is eternal. Watchmen is really the exception because Watchmen is yeah. all new characters. You know, Alan Moore came in and was like, "We'll take some archetypes and just make new characters and tell a story." Mm -hmm. And it was like, holy crap. But it was also produced by DC. If Watchmen had, be, had been uh, produced by, let's say, Charlton Comics or somebody like that, it would not have gotten the buzz. It was yeah. all because DC did it. Yeah, so, all about um, the publicity of it all, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you know, if, if we're over here and we're like, hey, I've, I've got a Watchmen thing that's really super cool, I'm not going to get the play, you know, because it's it's not DC. But yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, I, I think expansion of what you have should always come before the creation of something just completely new because you can always create something new within what you have. So if you build, if you do a six issue miniseries for a new superhero character, that entire universe has now been built, right? So it's not just that you made a character, it's you created a universe and a world for them to exist in. So when that, even if that story is done, like let's say you don't want to do that character again, you still have that world. So it's like saying, we're going to do a Batman story, right? But at the end of Batman, we also introduced Catwoman and Robin and the Penguin. You can now tell stories with all of those guys. So there's always a way to expand and tell organic stories within what you've already done without just jumping to like, well, I did superheroes. Now I'm doing my Star Wars thing, you know? And I'm not saying don't do it, but again, the more you can uh engage your audience in what you've created in that in that bubble um yeah. you know the the better it's going to be for the creation and for you and the fans because they know what to, to expect more of it 
the other thing is like of you know like oh sorry i was going to say like uh this is what i was looking for all right so these were packages like brought out like talking about marketing right mm -hmm. that um, um dc did so they introduced this all over the world so you had like italy and all that and so uh this one i do need my gloves for because you know so you had these um cover art that went all out there to promote it on lithograph kind of like card paper. sure yeah and so you know you had all 12 and you had all these different ones and you had like the inked ones without the color and so there was a portfolio that you know basically it was like french covers were here as well um and so that sort of being part of the um uh, being part of a publisher like dc with that money behind it to push it and was it was this a Karen Berger thing? I can't remember who was an editor on this to make this work. Oh, I have no idea. I, wasn't she? She was the Vertigo person, wasn't she? Yeah. So, so I don't, I, and I'm sure she had a DC position prior, but I don't know how far back she goes. That's the, all I, that stuff about editors and stuff. I don't really, I don't, yeah. I don't know who edited all this stuff, you know, a million years ago. So this is the French covers, you know, they brought that out and then they had like the promotional posters and stuff. And this came in a portfolio uh you know which i bought a couple of years ago for about like 60 bucks for like they're worth you know whatever uh and but i think you know when you have something like you know like i said a publisher behind you like that then it sort of becomes so much more uh you know but if you're on your own and which is what you know for for all of us who are doing kickstarter and stuff without publishers and i know a lot of there's a push to get to publishers and you know because afterwards now that the most of the marketing is done <laughs> through through Kickstarter, right? Because usually a lot of publishers are using that to actually promote. And uh, yeah, there's the not work. really much marketing in the comic book world. I mean, all these, yeah. all these, at least that I've seen. You know, I mean, I've I've worked with uh, a, a number of publishers now, and I, I don't really see a lot of advertising marketing. Yeah. Like I see them talking to uh, comic book resources and you know the websites and you know all that kind of stuff, which is fine. But yeah. Um, we don't have the push that that we used to have like back in yeah. the 80s and 90s of of you know a lot of this stuff again i'm not in comic book stores as much anymore so i don't see it maybe there's more than i than i realize i know scout comics has done some stuff with like in-store displays and so on mm. um but um it, it's it, it all of those small press guys they they all struggle just like just like I do, you know, without even yeah. being in comic book stores, I, I'm, yeah. I struggle, they struggle because we don't have the characters that DC and Marvel have. So right. we have, and that's where the more you can push your single character, your single universe, yeah. whatever you want to be, right. you can be known for something at a, at a very right. small level. But, you know, if someone comes to my booth, um, they have some awareness of who I am. Right, they're like, well, hmm. oh, critter. I know critter. Oh, I know Legend of Oz, or I know Shahrazad, or I know right. some of these few books that we've really done a lot of books for. Right, and um, and so those are my Batman. You know, critter is my Batman. Uh, right, you know, and and, and so on, or, or or Legend of Oz. Dorothy Gale's my Batman. Whatever it is. Yeah. So the more that you can attach yourself to a specific thing for a hmm. period of time, versus eight things that all have one issue. Um, right. You know, a, a hyper focus will 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 go further, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, we've got like um, I think right now, issue two of Incredible is hitting. Um, is supposed to once it's delivered, like issue one's getting delivered right now from to Becker's, right? So as soon as that hits, issue two is coming out over at uh, Rising Sun. Uh, was it like Rising Sun uh, Kickstarter? And so th that's going to be cool. Um, and we're looking at like putting out a trade paperback so the for the manga and then we're looking at putting a i mean for the manga being a manga right a white book uh colorless and everything um and then looking at doing um a trade paperback because i think getting to that trade paperback is important because completion right you got to complete your art and a lot of times sure. people don't complete the art and uh, i think because you gotta have a start and a finish and then you can like pop off and do another one and i wonder you know if that's damaging also to kickstarter because or to people like us on kickstarter because people aren't finishing their art 
Sure. Uh, for I mean, it's, it's not damaging to us. What what you do doesn't damage me, right? Sure. Now, in the in the micro, kind of, because someone mm -hmm. could just get a bad taste in their mouth, like, oh, Aru yeah. didn't finish his book, and so yeah. probably that means no one else does. Like, so in, in the tiny, minute mm -hmm. percentage, sure. Okay. Um, but the way that we're seeing Kickstarter continue to boom, mm -hmm. um, uh, even with with creators that have next to no following uh to, yeah. to get started with um i'd say that there's more than enough people that that understand um yeah. hey i'm helping this guy do an issue it, it may be a vanity project it may just be that he wants to do the one and, and i'm getting mm -hmm. out while here's all these other guys that are doing all this stuff regularly yeah. and this comes back to branding guys yeah. branding that i keep talking about if you yeah. can create branding for yourself so that every time you go on Kickstarter, mm. you have some sort of a design element, even if it's a different yeah. title, the design element is similar. That way yeah. people that that maybe don't know what your new thing is, there'll be a design element and a logo to it that people will be yeah. like, oh, I think I bought something else from that guy. Uh, yeah. and, and they might click on the thing. Um, so yeah, it, it's, um, again, I, I think in the tiny percentage, sure, but in the large scale, no. People, people learn uh over time who to trust who not to trust uh who yeah. they're who they're just helping do a vanity project and who's actually there regularly and if you're there mm -hmm. regularly clearly you're doing your job because otherwise yeah. no one would be backing your stuff um and, yeah. and that's a and that's a thing that over time if you fuck it up uh you will just naturally start to you know fall off uh, yeah. and uh, and that's just an indicator that you're not fulfilling your books or um, you know, the quality is bad or, you know, whatever it happens to be, yeah. but, um, it's, it's pretty easy to just kind of look at a creator's profile there and look through the last few things that they've done and get a mm. sense of if they're really trying, uh, and, and, and making things happen, mm. even if they're slow at it, or they're just there to grab some money and, you know, disappear. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the other thing is like, I, I like seeing like, um, the support that's now for indie comics that wasn't there for before, you know, seeing mm -hmm. like, um, I think a lot more, a lot more people are opening up to it and, uh, you know, like panels and stuff like that, like other, um, you know, uh, kind of like stores are opening a bit more because of the change and the drop. No, in that's not, no, 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 no. I don't believe it's that at all. I don't believe that at all. Um, no, 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 not in the slightest because sales numbers haven't don't indicate that. Um, okay. from, from a from a buyer perspective, yes, and that's why crowdfunding works because people are right. like, yeah, give me something else. Like, what else is there besides Batman? Yes, okay. but from a retail standpoint, sales numbers are dumping. I mean, just constantly mm. dumping. Um, okay. Not every time, not every issue, not every particular title or whatever. But there's no mm. surge in in the indie market in the retail side of things, right? right. Um, things will occasionally come in and pop certainly mm -hmm. uh particularly if they're like within image or something again if it's a big publisher and the publisher's like yeah. you got a thing you know people get excited but when it's just yeah. sort of like just sort of low level guys that you know they don't have names attached to them or whatever it's very hard to get a pop um and mm -hmm. uh, uh most independent books uh from the lower levels will sell they'll, they'll generally top out around 1000 to 2000 units it's not very much wow. um and and there's no there's nothing showing that that's going to go up. Uh, stores right. are closing. Um, the stores that do carry yeah. independent stuff, they don't carry everything. Um, even my store, like I I'm published by Antarctic Press, they don't carry Antarctic Press except for their pull orders. So if they right. if someone orders it, they will order it for you 100. Um, yeah. percent They only ordered the exciting comics and put it on the shelf because it was me. And they were right. like, well, yeah, we'll buy like 10 copies and put it on the shelf. Um, and, and you know, maybe you come sign them. I'm like, yeah, of course. Happy to. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it takes something like that to give uh, a, a small press book, an indie book, sort of any sort of real pop. And mm. it's very difficult to do because we don't have time to talk to 2,000 stores, uh, you know, across the country to, to you know, yeah. buy our book from Diamond. We just don't have that time, um, mm. you know. So yeah, it, it it takes a lot of effort to do it, and 
uh, the ones that do do it well have teams. A lot of these places like Scout and Vault and whatever, they all have teams of people trying to, you know, push books on on retailers and stuff. And that's great. But a lot of us just don't have that. Like for Big Dog Inc., it's me. That's, that's it. Yeah. I mean, outside of the art and the colors and stuff, like literally everything yeah. else is me. Every <laughs> aspect of the business is me. So yeah. when AP was like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll like publish your stuff. I was like, whoo, man, that's. That'll put me back in there. That'll put eyes yeah. on me. And I have no work to do, uh, yeah. again, other than art direction, because we put new covers on the stuff. We give AP new covers. Um, yeah. But that's easy enough to do. So uh, uh, I was like, yeah, man, that's that's fantastic. I, I'm, I'm not even concerned about making any sort of serious money out of it. I just, I, I want the eyeballs just on the product. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and, 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 and just to get the name out there, I think that's what people yeah. don't understand why you want the shops. You want the shops because that's going to, it's kind of allowing you to get branded. It's going to get publicity yep. Yep. because then people can then come back to you anyway. Yep. Right. Because you want people to come back to you. You want your 20% to be always following you. And this, you know, like the shop thing, it's like 80% of, 100% of your customer that comes through the door, only 20% stays with you forever and supports you forever. The other 80 are just whenever they want. And I learned that when like running my conch store, right? It's like the the 20% that stayed, I looked after really well. It was like, yo, okay, yep, because I know you're coming regularly. Okay, you get a bonus, you get a discount, you get this, you get that, and they stay and they stay and they stay. And now they're my best friends, you know. But I think a lot of times people don't understand why the comic stores matter. And they and because that's where, you know, what I say. Well, they, they, they get stuck on the idea that they matter because of sales and money. And that's not yeah. why it matters. Um, it matters yeah. because you get the chance to put eyeballs on your project, whether yeah. it's just that store's uh, uh, customers. Uh, you mm -hmm. don't know who those customers are, particularly stores like in Los Angeles or whatever. Yeah. Hollywood people are floating around all the time looking at comic book stores. So you never know who's mm -hmm. going to see what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the value of the stores. This is what I've said for many, many years. The value of the stores is not the money you make. It's the marketing that you get out of it, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, yeah. you know, if it costs you $3,000 to print and, and make a book for, for Diamond, you know, hopefully you get that 3000 back just so you break yeah. even. Like, that's all you need is break even. And exactly. then the rest of it is all eyeballs on, on your product. Yeah. And hopefully they go look you up and find your website and find your Kickstarter and, you know, you, you continue yeah. to grow that way. And hopefully you've done enough, um, you put enough information in that comic book to publicize where you are, where they sure. can find you easily. And that, you know, that you can find your website, you can contact you directly if you need to do any purchases, yeah. you know, and like, and I think a lot of times, um, and, and the other side of this, a lot of these creators, they don't get out and promote yeah. their book. Yeah. And it's like the worst thing in the world. It's like, do you not believe in your pro product? Like, do you not stand behind your product? Do I don't you think that's the case. The I, I think right? that's a, I think that's just a fear thing. Like they, yeah. they, they, number one, a lot of people nowadays, they just have, they just don't want to be around people. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're, for, they don't have a, a, the ability to talk to people. Like I see it all the time. I've seen it for decades. It's not just yeah. a now thing. It's for decades. I've watched yeah. artists at comic cons do nothing but just sit at their booth. Like, yeah. someone going to come. I don't know if anyone's going to come. Like, what are we doing here? You know, like they just don't have the personality for it. And yeah. so a lot of those people figured that out and they just hired a friend like, Hey, yeah, come and help me run like, my booth yeah, so that I don't have to talk. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and I get that hundred percent. I, I totally get yeah. it. But you have to be able to do something from the bare minimum element, uh, yeah. to, to make people care about what you're making. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, it might be you that sells it and not it that sells it. Exactly. Right? Um, yeah. So, you know, you, you, you have to have that. And if you don't have that, you have to be aware of it and you've got to hire somebody to do it for you. You got yeah. to go to a con and have a friend sell your book and say, yeah. Oh, Hey, and this is Tom and he'll sign it for you. And, yeah. and you know, go, go from there. I mean, even me, I, I still struggle at cons. Uh, yeah. trying to like, Hey, come and look at my thing. But I've had people at my booth that are much better at it and they are yeah. great at like, Oh, Hey, what do you like? Come see, we got the thing and Tom's over there and let the, yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a better sort of environment than, than just one person standing there. Like, yeah. what do we do now? You know? Yeah. It's, it's also like, I mean, like, I, I feel like, I mean, if more people were out here, uh, promoting the work, the more we, you know, the wider 
the net becomes because sure. you know because it, it it's like there's more people seeing more things out sure. like i mean like i've had like uh friends of mine say hey i want to start a podcast do it <laughs> damn it do it yeah. uh, here's the tools you got to use here's yeah. here's the streaming thing you got to use here's this and this is how you do it this is all it do it yeah you know I, i've talked to dozens of artists and offered them time on the artist yeah. alley shopping network like you can have your own two-hour block it's for you do yeah. whatever you want it doesn't cost anything they're like, eh, I don't know. I, I can't, yeah. I don't know what I would do. I'm like, you draw, like, just watch what the other people there are doing. You just draw, you talk about movies. Like, I don't care what you do. Sell yeah. your comics, sell your art, make money. I'm not taking anything, like nothing. Yeah. It is a free thing that we created for you to use. Eh, I'm not yeah. really, I don't know, really good. I'm just like, oh my God, dude, uh, that's ridiculous. Um, yeah. You have to get over that stuff. And that's the same thing with podcasts is people go on podcasts and they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing or, you know, whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, and I understand that some podcasts are like gotcha podcast yeah. stuff. Um, so, you know, you, you, you avoid that stuff, but when you're just going on and just talking about what you do and, and what you like, uh, yeah. in, in comics, like, Oh yeah, I like Chris Claremont. Oh yeah. We all like Chris Claremont. You know, it, it, it works itself. And then out. You talk with Chris Claremont and then yeah, yeah, the next thing you know, like, Oh, well, so, you're a writer, right? Yeah. So, what was Chris? Did he influence you on your writing? Yeah. Uh, but maybe. And then you talk about that, and then now you're yep. brought back to your work. Yeah. And I think yep. that's why I like enjoy what we do here with Plungers. Like, like tonight we we're talking to a guy who owns a comic store, right, in New Zealand, for decades, and what he's done and his friendships with other um, creators in New Zealand, and a lot of people don't know that. And even in New Zealand, they don't know that, like the decades of work, but they just know the store. And I think, like, by by opening up these doors to, um, you know, people who normally wouldn't come on and talk about, like, in this sort of, um, I guess, you know, like, because we we put it across on Facebook, we've put it across, some, used to do it on Twitch as well, as well as, you know, YouTube. So there's three different avenues. I mean, it goes on my own personal thing. It goes on to the Plungecast thing. It goes, sometimes it goes on the Rising Sun page as well which is you know the imprint that i'm part of so uh or the small press i'm part of but i think i just wonder like you know you talk about fear but like what you know how do people get over that fear though you know you have to do it literally i mean it's 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 the it's it's the dumbest thing you get over it by doing it you get yeah. used to doing it you know um and and i was the same way i i i didn't used to like to do these things um but you know i i, I started to do it enough where uh, and i did it with people that i was comfortable with initially that's where it has to start yeah. don't just dive into some cold place that you don't know where it is or who these people are right <laughs> but if you're going in and you're just with a couple of friends or a or somebody who you've watched interview people before so you know kind of how they do it and what to expect yeah. That's how you do it. It's just you you do a little bit and you do a little bit and you do a little bit and and mm. eventually you understand the process. Yeah. Um and then you can, you know, and then your your self-confidence will kind of build through that. And the more that you do it, uh the more confidence that you'll have in in what you're saying uh and uh, uh whatever. <laughs> I wonder if it's because now, you know, because social media is like, just like, you know, you can post something and stuff, but like YouTube's a bit different or like video right, casting, doesn't matter if it's on, you know, live casting um, on, you know, whatever channel, right? Like Twitter, you can have that now, you can do that, but also on Facebook and Instagram, I think it's short videos. But I wonder if it's because instantaneous, right? You're saying something, you're afraid if you say something, like you yeah. said earlier, sure. saying the wrong thing. Sure. But I mean, you can always correct yourself, right? You can always, oh, no, hold on, hold on. Like, uh, yeah, no, that's not what happened. What, no. And people understand that. And I think the fear is that pe people think that people will use that in a, in a negative way. Sure. And, but if, you, if you've corrected yourself, you give yourself time to correct yourself. I think it's... It, it should be fine. I mean, I remember, like, I always say this. I, when I first spoke in front of people, in front of people, I was 15 years old, in front of my peers, I boiled my eyes out in front of my peers. It was the most shameful thing I ever happened. Like, I was trying to give a, you know, a speech on Kiss, the band. Yeah. And I made this amazing speech, did it in front of my class, was fine. Stood up there, yeah, cool. Now I was amongst everybody else who was fifth form, like, like year 12 or something like that. I think it is New Zealand. I mean, around the world. And, you know, 15-year-olds. And I'm like... I got into about two lines. I cried my eyes out, but I still read it. <laughs> you know? And then after that, I didn't read for, you know, didn't do that for three years. But then I was like, bam, 
never going to be afraid to do that again, you know? And yeah. And I mean, part of it is also just confidence in what you're talking about, right? So if you know yeah. you're going to be talking about your book, you should have some confidence in that because you know what it is, you know who the people are, you know, you let the interviewer lead you through what's going on. Some interviewers yeah. are good, some are not good. You know, you also have to yeah. deal with that. But, you know, you should have confidence in what you're talking about as far as your book goes, right? Mm. And then if the if the conversation drifts off into, you know, also oh, you've seen any movies lately or whatever, again, same thing. It doesn't matter yeah. what your opinion is. People will agree with you or don't agree with you, whether you like it or not. Yeah. It's irrelevant. Just be like, yeah, I, I like that one or I didn't like that one or, you know, just – it's it's just conversational and and yeah. just treat it that way uh and 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 kind of you know you got to find a way to just sort of loosen up and 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 understand that nothing that we're talking about is the end of the world right none of us have our yeah. our finger on the nuclear button like none of us are doing that so we're all just over here like talking about whether or not star wars is good like who cares yeah. You know, get you know, bring me your nerddom, and and whether it's yes or no, like bring it, and and I want you know, people like to see the passion of it, one That's way or it. the other. Just like let's yeah. let's just talk nerd stuff, and if the nerd stuff yeah. happens to bring back, hey, oh by the way, I'm making a comic book that's kind of like Star Wars. Awesome. Then then yeah, you just bring exactly. it back. Yeah, this is my thing, and you can get it on Kickstarter or whatever. But just you know, you got to understand that none of this is so serious that we're doing, uh, and and discussing that. It's going to matter, you know, in 24 hours. The you know, they're on to the next guest, and right? you know, yeah. the next book comes out, and you know, every week there's a new thing at comic book stores. It's like we're just having fun in the moment, and yeah. uh, you know, try and enjoy the fun in the moment. That's it. I, I remember, like, um, when I, you know, I wanted to do this three years ago, and I, you know, when we started doing the plunge convention. I'd interview like the guests that were there, you know, we go, oh, you, you guys are coming up. Let's have spend an hour doing this. And then I found that like, this is going to be, take a bit of work. And now it doesn't even feel like work. I've been on it for about six months, right? Seven months, whatever it is. I, it doesn't feel like work. I just get up, jump on and start doing it. And it's like, oh, this is fun. You know, you talk about what are you like? Like, oh, you know, today we're talking about your books, you know, and calling you up and, you know, texting you and say, hey, can we, I'm going to do the unboxing. And now we get to see these amazing books, you know, that's been delivered, you know, by us just meeting, you know, and talking and interviewing. And, and now, and here's the thing, the fact that we did this right across this, and now you got to purchase through me. Now I get to enjoy a piece of art, right. Signed as well. And I now, now you've not only have you got me as, you know, as a fan for ages for 14 years. Now you've actually got me buying off you and now you got me promoting you. Sure. And now I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking your praises by giving my friends going, go read this book. And, you know, and here's the way you can get. The... And the thing is, just because of me interviewing you that one time. Right. And then later on, we, you know, develop kind of like acquaintances, friendships, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, pleasantries across social media. Because I think the, the weird thing is I've been thinking about this really recently, how there's a social media friendship. Right. Where sure. we don't actually break bread, yep. and then there's a, uh, and then there's the actual friendship where we actually, you know, real life, you know, IRL, what they call it, sure. right, in real life, where we break bread. But I think the fear here is that people think that because of cancellation culture on social media, that by making friends with certain, you know, certain people, now you're, you know, you, you're worried and watching your back. And I find that kind of, kind of a sad place to be, where like, you know, people. It, it is. But yeah. that's also, I mean, that's a real thing. Um, and, and you have to do your homework as far as doing that to some degree. Um, mm. But, you know, for the most part, again, none of us are at any sort of level of anything that exactly. you know, the, the world in general, the, the culture of comics or whatever, is going to worry mm. about who we do an interview with. Like, it's just, mm. it's, it's, again, it's that minuscule, percentage right yeah and and even if someone was like oh that guy was on our show boo like you know 24 hours later who cares everybody's moved exactly. on to something else you know it's it's just yeah. it's like eh, you know it's fine yeah. you know if, if we talked about something uh controversial and they want to yeah. talk to me about it that's fine but we haven't talked about anything here that's that's you know out of bounds or weird or anything so yeah you know i don't even uh, and, and that's for me that's what i always it. try and do on my shows right anytime yeah. i'm on somebody's show it's like 
let's just keep it light, man. Like, let's just talk about comics and, Hey, do you remember when they made that thing in 1992? Like, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, and, and a lot of people, two things, one, a lot of people will have the nostalgia for that kind of stuff. They're like, Oh my God. Yeah. I haven't thought about that in a long time. And then there's yes. another side of people that don't know about it. And yeah. so they're getting a history lesson of, of, you know, what comics used to be at a certain time and, and, you know, yeah. whatever, like we're talking about Watchmen. Like that was, that was something that never should have worked. Uh, yeah. but because the eighties were the way that the eighties were, um, it, it, the, 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 the culture and the, the, the readership and the viewers, they were ready for that at that moment. Exactly. And, uh, you know, that, that's always interesting to look at why that worked here. And then, you know, they tried to do new Watchmen and people were like, why are we doing new Watchmen? Like, yeah. wow, that's kind of weird. Like that's, that's an interesting thing. And a lot yeah. of that is just because of creator respect, right? Creator loyalty. They're like, you've been jacking over Alan Moore for 40 years. Like we're not going to yeah. support whatever this thing is. So, exactly. Um, yeah. you know, again, so, you know, you're giving your, your viewers uh, something that matters versus Coke or Pepsi, man. Like, are you, are you the red can or the blue can? Like no one cares. It's just, it doesn't matter. Let's talk about cool stuff. Yeah. I think that's what I enjoy about like just doing the one-on-one -on -one interviews, like, like especially with pop. Right. And like, it's just light. It's ne I'm never want to know about your deep, dark, you know, depressive moments in life. I just want to talk about <laughs> what inspired you to do art and, you know, and just, just know you for, you know, and kind of, you know, it's also, it also might seem superficial, but I don't want people to know your dark, whatever periods in life, how you, you know, struggled and all that. I just want to know so that people can be inspired by seeing that you got A to B, sure. to Z, you know, to C to Z. Everybody has bad moments, you know, yeah. and it, it's, it's how I you, too, I mean, yeah. some people talk <laughs> about them because they use that for inspiration. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I went through a really bad period when I had my divorce and, and it was a few years, it was the, right with the years with Aspen and really Aspen yeah. was, was what kept me going. I mean, if I did not have Aspen at that moment, I'll yeah. tell you right now, I don't know that I would have been here. Um, yeah. because I was in a really bad place with that all happening, but Aspen yeah. was there and, and all those people were great and I was traveling with them. And, and eventually I, I worked myself, you know, kind of through kind of a, all of that. Yeah. Uh, we came out the other end and, and, you know, we've sort of rebuilt everything after, after the mm -hmm. Aspen years, but you know, I, I Aspen and, and Frank and Vince and, uh, and Peter and everybody, you know, all the cosplay girls that were there and, and just everybody, all the artists were awesome. It was yeah. great for me because, and, and a lot of people don't know because they see me like on, on, uh, Facebook and stuff. Right. And I'm taking pictures yeah. of them. They're like, Oh yeah, Tom's like doing really good. And I'm well, they, yeah, they don't see me like after the con is shut down and they don't see me when I'm driving in my car and they don't see me when I'm alone in a hotel. Yeah. And, like you have no idea how, it really was. And that's yeah. the other scary thing about social media is it's not, none of it's real, man. I mean, yeah. I shouldn't say none of it's real, but like there's a lot of just propping up and, and like, Hey, look oh, at me. I'm, I'm yeah. look at me, look at me. Like I'm doing yeah. something cool. But once that selfie is done, uh, you have no idea what the rest of that dude's day is. So, yeah. you know, just be cool to people, man. Like people, you have no idea what people are doing and going through in their life. So yeah. just be cool about it. You know, it, just let them, let them, let them be. It's the, there's, there's no value in uh, attacking there's and chasing down like, people like that. Yeah. There's something like going through Christmas and realizing like I was, when we were coming into Christmas and I was doing part of like, you know, live streams and stuff. And I was thinking, I need to change next year. How I do this, you know, like really simplify and really think about positive stuff and like mm -hmm. how put out positive stuff yep. and not really, you know, you know, not really go and go boom, you know, dish on Disney and or, or Marvel or DC because that's just promoting this shit. And I think, I, I think it was you that said that, right. It was you who said that, well, what you, when you talk about that shit, you're just promoting them. So why, you know, and I said, well, you know, yeah. Well, and two them. things. One, all you're doing yeah. is platforming whatever it is you're talking about. You're platforming yeah. it. You're giving it time. And two, you're not changing anybody's mind. No. If someone loves Star Wars, you're not going to make them not love Star Wars. That's yeah. it. So I get I get the the drama brings views or whatever, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But I, I feel like that's just, 
I don't feel any anything genuine about any of that stuff. There's tons tons of people that do it. All kinds of people report on the news. I'm like, pop culture is not news, guys. Um, yeah. But they, they do it, and that's fine or whatever. But I don't find any genuine reality from those guys. So I'm I'm happy to come on and and like uh, critique movies and like, hey, let's talk about why I didn't like yeah. it and you did, and like, let's figure that. Like that's a, that again, that's quality to me because now we're yeah. diving into the construction of the film, the storytelling, the acting. Uh, and we do that with comics too. It's like, what's, is the pacing good? Is the art good? Yeah. Like what's the presentation? So, yeah. To Why critique like something a, is great, yeah. but to be like, oh, I just heard that Gina Carano is like, who cares? Just let them do their, what they're doing. It has no effect yeah. on you in any way, unless you're a Disney stockholder, then maybe. Um, but uh, yeah. you know, other than that, it just doesn't I, matter. I just leave that to the post because I find that funny. Like, because I, I saw somebody like, like it was weird watching people like attack other people because they don't like that people because of what they said and then like now you're gonna make a video about that and then you're gonna do that and then somebody else is gonna make it's like this ever you know the cycle thing yeah one one thing i um i i do i i saw something interesting yesterday characters without logos what do you think about that like actual like just costumes but no logos and no icons to actually make it stand out distinctiveness no but distinctiveness, right? No logo. She's got uh, yeah, I mean, you can right have here. a yeah. That's where just design comes in, right? So yeah, you can have a character that has no logo, like like this, like we're talking about like a Superman s guys or something like that, yeah. right? You can make a character that has no logo but still has a distinctive design to it, right? right. Um, even Deadpool, I don't even think Deadpool in its original incarnation had like that circle belt buckle thing. You know no, what I mean? I, I think that came later, you know, with his, with yeah. like his eyes on it. Right. Um, yeah. I know he had a belt buckle or some kind, but I don't think it was like a logo thing in the original Rob Liefeld incarnation mm -hmm. that that stuff all came later. Um, yeah. So yeah, you can do it. I mean, uh, and, and I'll tell you that like with the critter design, um, I'll try and get you guys a, a look at the whole thing. Um, a lot of I this mean, was like cool. designed for color um contrast mm. right so even though yeah. it's a simple design it's kind of it's very like 70s and 80s there. you know sort of design but the colors yeah. contrast uh she's got her belt she's got her tail um it's yeah. simple to draw so the artist can can move quickly through it um you know and and now that she's been around for so long uh you know she's she's become sort of iconic at least within the big dog brand again right within the big dog yeah. brand um right. i mean and you're right like so character wise right no logo mm -hmm. very popular character ray uh from um re zero uh life in another world uh no you know this is just like one of like they just like a costume character type thing but it's not actually you know it's just her blue hair was what makes it work but you know so you're right like you don't necessarily need the thing, but like your character design works because it's specifically to that character sure. and you've got that character standing out. It's a bit like Naomi, right? Naomi's the same way. And like, you know, you don't always have to have character, mm -hmm. but I mean, sorry, logos or, you know, icons, but I want like, there's sometimes people do it and they don't really design the character enough to make it unique. Yep. Whereas you, you have really have made it unique. And so does Naomi. Naomi has a unique look to it, which is really cool. Yeah. And I think, you know, people love that because of the uniqueness of the character design. But I, I, do you, I think a lot of people do a disservice if they're going into the hero genre, right? Superheroes and stuff and trying to brand. They, they don't understand the concept of what makes comics work. And they're in there trying to make comics work and try to make superhero comics without knowing what works. But I mean, also, you really, I think it's all about, do you think it's about character development to test what's, you know, to develop your character or do you just, I mean, what is it about that makes a character work? Sorry, I should, should ask that question. It's, it's going to be different for all the characters because it depends on what your character is. So like, for example, Critter is not the same as the Punisher, right? They have completely, they're polar opposite uh, character types. So, you know, I, I think the design is key and logos or, or, you know, chest plate things or whatever. Um, mm. they can help you for sure. I'm not telling you not to do those things, guys. I'm, that's not yeah. what I'm saying at all, but, um, I don't think that they're required. 
Um, yeah. As long as your design of the character has something that uh, just is, is eye catching, it, it catches your eyes. So whether yeah. that could be color, that could be cat ears and a tail, that could be big hands, that, you know, whatever it is. It has to be able to, when someone walks by the rack or by your booth or whatever, and they yeah. look at the banner behind you, like, oh, what is that? Um, yeah. That's that's it. it. It has to catch your eye. Now, that doesn't mean the story's good, but yeah. it has to. It always has to start with design because comics yeah. are visual first. Uh, yeah. Again, art carries comics right now. So um, yeah. visual design first, and then you have to have, like just in the superhero context, You've got to have a world for the superhero to exist in that yeah. challenges the hero. I mean, and that's kind of all stories, but particularly in superheroes, because if you just come in and you're like, oh, my superhero can do everything. Well, you know what? Then who cares? You know, it's sort of like Superman. Yeah. It's one of the things that I think people struggle with Superman is because he can do basically everything. Yeah. Right. So Superman's. Yeah weaknesses even though he has kryptonite weakness of course yeah but superman's weakness yeah. is the people around him and that's why yeah. he has his secret identity that's why he's clark kent because if people know that he that superman is married to lois lane and he works at the daily planet like the yeah. bad guys will come and and that was the whole yeah. superman 2 thing right is lex luther yeah. was like i got something for you that you might yeah. like and and he because he knew that lois and and him were were you know, together in some capacity. So that's the, that's the big Superman weakness is, is, you know, his love for humanity, but specifically his, you know, his bubble. Um, so you have to be able to, if you have over, and that's the same with invincible, right? Invincible is the same thing. Invincible is basically uh, a, a lower powered Superman because he doesn't have yeah. like eye beams and stuff, but he flies, he's like hyper strong, you know, whatever. So it's the same thing. Like he can get I'm, I'm he's bulletproof and stuff, you know? Yeah. So, you have to have a story where something can hurt him. And in this case, what could hurt him was his dad, because his dad was stronger than him. All of the yeah. Viltrumites stronger than him. And of course, he had to protect Adam Eve and, you know, his mom and, you know, all that kind yeah. of stuff. So he was, he's sort of a lower powered Superman. Um, but, you know, Kirkman came in knowing that he was going to make, and he did this throughout the series. He had all of these junk superheroes that, that he would just, Invincible just come in and just be like, whap, like this is done. What else is there? And we, we've yeah. moved on to the larger story. So he was having fun beating up characters like the elephant, uh, you know, just, just, just nonsense stuff. Um, and then, yeah. but then you'd have guys like Doc Seismic who could like, blow volcanoes out of the ground like what does it matter how strong you are if this guy can like blow up volcanoes anywhere in the world right so you've got to just be able to create problems for your character based on yeah. what they're able to do and and have them find a way to work their way through it or just lose um yeah. and and be like holy shit that guy got me you know i'm i'm i, I, I gotta get him you know now i've got to i've got to it's, it's sort of like wrestling right you've gone through a point and it's like uh, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to win the championship. Oh fuck. He beat me. I don't have the championship. I got to chase yeah. this guy again. So it's just all in the storytelling and, and understanding what your characters sort of limits are understanding what their, uh, um, weaknesses, uh, weaknesses uh -oh. are, yeah. What their weaknesses are, whether physical, emotional, or a rock, <laughs> uh, you know, well, and the desires, right? What's their desires? What makes them tick? right? What yeah, and and, and then <laughs> yeah, but once you know limits yeah. and weaknesses, um, that's how you play with the desires. Because then, right. if the desire is X, Y, and Z, you know that they can't go past this level, and yeah. if they go too far down, they're screwed. So they have to mm -hmm. find their way in the roller coaster of staying within yeah. these bounds of of ultimate power and ultimate weakness and in the mm -hmm. middle is your story that should be a roller coaster taking them through wins and losses and you know and, and whatever so yeah i i hated like i hated superman for years like because of the fact that he was so omnipotent right i mean powerful yeah, yeah. and it never really got me and like i wasn't to you know i um and i never got into superman until like 20 20 uh, 2005 or something like that you know after reading the, you know, uh, I think I can't remember who wrote it, but like it was like the novelization of um, Death of Superman, like mm -hmm. this thing, and that's what got me into it. It's like, really, oh, 
right i can now see all the people around him you know when steel comes in why steel picks up the hammer and starts doing his thing mm -hmm. why the other people do you know they find his body and all this and that made me go okay now i'm a dc person never was a dc person now i'm a dc even though i watched you know superman returns and superman the first one on vhs when i was a kid but it never really brought me into that world and i think but then like you said kryptonite then i didn't even think about the lex luther with um two i've it's been years since i've seen it but even dvd is there that's so i was looking for it um but like you know superman 2 with lex um you know targeting um lois i had forgotten about that you know and i think i was thinking when you said that i was thinking about spider-man right also with Peter, Same thing. you know, yeah. The mask. yeah, put on the they mask, were... save Mary Jane and Gwen and 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 Aunt May, and yeah, same thing. Yeah. While he other... learns how to be Superman or Spider-Man, while he learns yeah. what his limits are, while you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got like odd victims here. We got an interview with him in a couple of weeks. Because hey, like I can't what watch at a moment, but I'll leave a look up my hope to fetch this post premiere. Cool. Now, let's, let's talk about a bit about story. I mean, we talk about character. Let's talk about comic story. Like, I know there's like, you know, with like, there's a difference between comic story and novels, you know, and so on, and movies, because I know you're a big movie buff. So, you know, how does comic story work compared to like, say, if you're writing a movie, I'm doing a movie, or if you're doing, you know, a TV show or a novel? I don't think it, I don't think it's really different. Um, other than the constraints of time. So especially with comics and TV, you can just kind of go because you got episode, 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 issue, issue, issue. You can just kind of go. Um, yeah. With a movie, you have two hours and you've got to tell a right. complete story, generally speaking, within two hours. Um, even if you know you're going to do like a trilogy, you still have to have a self-contained sort of unit of the story with, you know, the open ending to, you know, take you on to the next thing. Um, so I don't think it's really all that different, uh, particularly because with comics, um, you can do anything you want. It's all just imagination. So if you want a big fleet of starships, you know, flying into the yep. earth, you just draw them. Um, whereas if you're doing movie or TV show, you can do the same thing, but that costs, you know, a lot of money to do all that CGI or, um, uh, model work or whatever. So, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's really any different, um, I think the the one thing that is different is that comics don't have uh, an inherent character personality to them. So in other words, uh, we understand that Tony Stark or um, Robert Downey Jr. is Tony Stark. So we impart that into the character, right? Um, but before Robert Downey Jr. became Iron Man, the comics had to tell us his personality. The comics had to tell us how he talks and, right. and, and, you know, if he's got like, for example, if he's got an accent or if he's, you know, from New York or if he's, you know, whatever, you know, the, 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 the dialect and everything that he talks, you know, we all speak English here in America, but that doesn't mean we all sound the same. Right. So, yeah. um, so in comics, you don't have the advantage of an actor putting that into your character. So you have to write dialogue that works in a context that as best as possible when the reader reads the words yeah. hopefully there's some sense of the voice in your head mm. right mm. um again and that's where like writing in accents and, and different like mm. uh locational dialects you know california does not sound like alabama you know the, it's it's just it's yeah. different so if you can separate those things in your characters even just a little bit uh, that will help your comic book get an extra layer of character to it. Whereas, right. you know, the the TV and the movies, the actors just get the lines and they figure out how they would mm. say it. How how does Tony Tony Stark say this? And then yeah. you know he he figures that out and it becomes you know becomes pop culture that way. <laughs> I was thinking about like when I first heard like Batman and he goes on oh, Batman. I'm like, I never th heard that in my head. <laughs> you know, when he comes well, but we that. also, yeah, we also never heard because oh, we grew up, most of us anyway, grew up yeah. with Batman as Adam West. Adam That's West right. never 
did anything as Batman. He just was yeah. Adam. He just was Bruce Wayne with a mask on. He never changed yeah. his voice. Uh, he and Bruce Wayne were identical. It was the same. Um, yeah. And so when we got to 89 with Tim Burton, um, Keaton changed it up. So Keaton had the weird kind of goofy Bruce Wayne sort of dialect. And then he had sort of a grumbly Batman, you know, but it was yeah. a simple grumble. It wasn't an aggressive Christian Bale grumble. It was just sort of a, I'm going to take my voice down a little bit and yeah. Batman, you know, and, and people knowing Bruce Wayne is the, hey, I don't know well, how many cases of thing are we going to like, that's a, that's a variation. So, um, and then Christian Bale, uh, didn't have the goofy Bruce Wayne. Mm. So when he went into Batman, he kind of almost had to go too far to separate yeah. himself from Bruce Wayne. Uh, and that's where we got the, I'm Batman, you know, just really yeah. heavy, aggressive, I'm Batman. And then yeah. uh, and then Ben Affleck kind of kind of did the same thing, but not really. He, he mm. pulled it back from Bale, but it was still very similar to Adam West. And there, there wasn't a ton of difference between mm. the two. Um, but because the Batman suit there, his Batman suit was that big bulky super muscle suit, right? Yeah. That's going to be your differential. Um, cause, cause Bruce Wayne doesn't look like that. Uh, yeah. so, you know, again, there's different ways to present the characters. Um, mm. and, um, voice is one design again is the other. Uh, and, yeah. uh, um, you know, off you go. Awesome. Now, let's talk about world building. I think uh, we'll finish up on that because I think, um, you know, we, we kind of like character, you know, story, and then the world building. I think world building comes kind of important. You touched on it a bit, right? How do they fit into their world? Um, do you want to talk a bit about that while I've got you? Well, again, it's like, uh, um, it's like we said, you have to create a world for your character to struggle in uh, or dominate. If, if that's your story, then they have to have a world that they, or powers or whatever, that they can come in and just take over, you know, generally the yeah. bad guys. Um, so you've, you've got to build a world where your character has to learn things about themselves, about the world, about the bad guys. They have to learn things along the way. Mm. Um, Cause if they just come in and they're just like, Oh, I punched you in the face and you're done like that. Who cares? That's, that's not interesting. Um, mm. So like back in the day, Batman was the world's greatest detective, right? So he, he even then he was doing detective things to figure out yeah. problems, not just running in and, and punching the Joker in the face. So yeah. Um, world building is character building. Because as you build another segment of the world for your character to exist in, your character grows again. Um, either through success or failure, your character grows again and again and again. And so every time you add a piece to the world, whether it's another character, whether it's another uh, segment of the city, or you know, if you take them to, you know, if they if they exist in New York, but you take them to Africa, like again, that that now makes Africa part of their world, and you know, yeah. they're they're again, they're learning, they're growing, they're failing, they're they're doing all those things. So you have to have a a world where the the the, the world can defeat them. I think that's the best potential world. It doesn't mean they have to lose every time, but you have to have a world where there's a sense of, yeah, this might not be good. Um, because again, it's all, it all has to be, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, sensory, um, disbelief, suspension of disbelief, oh, yeah. you yeah. know, because we all know critters not dying, right? But you have to create a story that is traumatic for the character in some cases, right. whether her, her friend dies or, you know, a bad guy ends up winning or, you know, whatever it is. You have to create trauma for the character. Uh, otherwise, there's nothing to push the character forward. Um, hmm. and, and, you know, when, when there's a trauma wall, boom, they either rise to the occasion and, and figure out a way to keep going or they collapse. And again, right. either way is a learning moment for the character. So. Yeah. The world that they live in has to be one that is, uh, uh, you know, challenging and um, and it can be multiple things. There can be portions of it where it's like, well, this is the comfort zone and I'm going to go in the comfort zone and then we're going to go over here and this is a big problem. Uh, and, and, you know, somewhere in between or, or, you know, sort of like those 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 
throwaway guys like the elephant from Invincible. Right. You know, just have some fun. Hey, I'm I'm up against a guy, and we're gonna punch and go through a building and just kind of have a little superhero fun. Yeah. On the way to the larger problems that you know right. they may not be able to solve with you know their fists. Awesome. Yeah, I think sometimes like like I mean like if you look at like for Go uh, like Gotham for Batman, that's like another aspect of his actual character. Sure. You know, it's like his home and it plays a real interesting part of it. Like I mean like especially what like was it Batman Begins where like they use La Ra's al Ghul making Bat you know made sure you know made people realize how important Gotham was to him, which we never really thought of in any other story before. I think far as, far as I understand, apart from like uh, Nightfall, Well, right? I mean, ba Gotham has always been a, a character in the Batman world, particularly mm -hmm. since um, since the Burton time, because Burton really gave Gotham its own life with, with his just right. sort of weird architecture and stuff. And ever since 89, uh, Gotham has always had weird stuff in the skyline, you know, all over the yeah. place. So um, it became its own character within the bat universe. And if you can do that, if you can create a location and stuff, and I'm not talking about just like the bat cave, but like, you know, these characters yeah. exist in a world of, of things and you have two choices. You can either say, Oh yeah, my character lives in New York, or you can say, Oh no, my character lives in Metropolis, even though right. they're, you know, adjacent, they're not exactly yeah. the same. That way you can have the LexCorp building versus, yeah you know, freedom tower Wayne, or whatever Wayne, you want. Wayne tower and also exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. And you can or mix Charlie, those as well. Right? You can, yeah, you yeah, can mix them as well. But like yeah. for me, for penny for your soul, penny for your soul takes place in Las Vegas and right. we use Las Vegas. Like we use the locations. We show you where you are on the strip and so on. So, you know, we use Las Vegas, uh, in a very specific manner. Um, mm -hmm. I know exactly where the Babylon hotel is in Las Vegas. Yeah. Uh, so that when we do our scenes of the city, I know what we're going to see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, and, and to me, I think that's just kind of fun. Um, Cause people that know Vegas, they're like, Oh yeah, that, that, that seems right. You know, Hey, there's yeah. that one. And there's that one. Um, so, you know, that can be fun, but it's also fun to just build your own stuff too. Yeah. We do that like right now with uh, Zealandia, like, um, you know, working, building this uh, fantastical world. Right. And so with that, we're able to like, um, and I'll just finish up on this, is that we're able to bring in um, our own world, like our own country into it, like, you know, fully into this world. Yeah. And so you get to see, like, the maps of this world. It's actually, you know, one one tenth the size of our world, our New Zealand. And, you know, right now we're doing a city, like um, an elf, elf, Alvin, always get it wrong, you know, just here, you know, waters right now, it's actually... And so I get to create and play around with this country in a, in a fantastical setting where, you know, where is something, let me find some other one. I think it's over at Plunge Studios. Um, I think so. Yeah. So, you know, playing around with the actual map of it and turning that map into a fantasy world and building like cities and, um, you know, castles around it like you know there's a there is a a human a, a japanese shogun run human uh domain over here then there's like uh elves over here and then there's like fairies over here but these are you know when people from new zealand or people who have visited new zealand get to see it they'll know exactly where it is even though it's got different names but and that's the fun of like well building right because you're able to that's like you said, like you can create within, uh, like you can have like your Star Labs, you can have your, uh, you know, Metropolis and you can have your Gotham. And I think it's pretty, uh, I mean, that's the other thing about comics is the cost factor, right? You can have, you can blow up stuff and there's no cost to it, right? Sure. There's no, yeah. <laughs> no CGI, no animation, no people, you know, getting hurt, stunt people and all this. And now it's just like the whole fact is just, it's just an art, amazing artist you know, whoever it is, just drawing up the imagination of the writer or the creator. And that's, I think that's what I love, truly love about comics is the aspect that you can just come up with these things and you can make it live in people's heads and live on paper 
and now fans are able to you know if they're willing to back it and uh support it and read it and like have it as as you know, you know as a piece of art in their home and like with your fit you know with with critter now a figure they can actually have a figure on their shelf or whatever and I, that's what I, I think you know that's the great thing about comics that i've always loved the world building the characters the longevity of it all and you know just the way that you know people you know they come along and they put their own little stamp on it sometimes we're good sometimes we're bad but i mean at the end you've still got the original character the way you know to go back to and um you know the best stories that you always loved you can always go and read them over and over mm -hmm. again you know just like me with a uh, penny for your soul right like i can always go back and read that and go yes i at that moment i read that and i was like so in love with it right away you know uh, to where i now i'm you know i signed a piece of the work and uh, i think you know thank you for your time man tom yeah, i really sure. appreciate it and i love the knowledge you bring and i think because of uh you know just your just your um the the fact that you've been around so long and been you know dealt with some stuff you know also in the shops also in like publishing also now with it i wanted to did want to ask you about um early on about your patreon and how you work on that so can can you do a like a five minute thing on yeah, that our, our patreon is is super simple it's it's basically just everything as we build it you know as we make it so um mm -hmm. it's it's for people who want to know how comics are made um from design stuff to logos to art to inks to colors to pages to you know just everything um we do everything kind of starts there and all of our patrons get to see everything as it comes through um okay. and uh they also get to do uh they also get to take part in it so we've we've given them opportunities to name some of our characters before right. um we, we've given them a list of like well we like these but what do you guys like and they've chosen names um they've gotten we did a uh, one of our days that we talked about right was um uh, uh national pillow fight day and so they got to choose the two combatants for pillow fight day um and um you know just all kinds of stuff like that so if you if you like to sort of watch and and learn how things get done uh mm -hmm. and and you're welcome to ask questions when people talk in there and you know they post they comment on the post and stuff if you got questions you're welcome to shoot questions in there um that's that's what it is I mean, and it's it's as little as five bucks a month you'll get all the posts and then if you're doing the ten dollar a month level um that's where you get to interact and do all of the voting and you also get a free um every six months our vip members get a free variant cover um right. that is exclusive to them they just they just get it it's just here's here's a thank you for being part of this for six months so um we just did that uh so we're in the next six month sort of frame right. so if anyone wants to to get in the next one will be get, will be coming out in uh, july we'll uh, everybody that's in it from from now through June will get one in July, and then we'll start the next uh, the next run. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically what's it the, for us. What's the page name? Can you just type it in? Um, um, the yeah, it's Patreon.com backslash mm -hmm. Big Dog Inc. Oh, okay, simple. Yep, yep, very simple. Big Dog Inc. Hey, what's your um? right what is your um do you have a twitter account yeah we're on twitter and instagram we're, we're on all the places i tried to there. i tried to add you for this um today and i didn't see it so you know it came up with something different and i don't want to like uh, yeah that's the one because i don't know if that was it or not well and our, our twitter and instagram are bdi comics so you can oh, find BDI. Us bdi comics yeah all right awesome and there you go, guys. Um, if you want to learn the ins and outs of comic uh, work and how it's done, and also get some amazing stuff, right? I mean, you can check that out as well. Because I saw that Patreon uh, cover and I was like, how does that work? You know, so that's pretty cool, man. I mean, you know, does it, do you send them overseas is a question. We'll work that out. Yeah. I mean, the shipping is drastic in that regard, but we, we'd figure it out. I mean, especially, you know, if you're buying stuff from us, we can just build you a box toss it in there or whatever we'll 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 figure that part out awesome all right thank you again toms sure. yeah it. thanks for having me it's always a good time yeah.
yeah, I was thinking like, oh, we have half an hour now. We got three times that. So you guys, you know, <laughs> thank you for hanging out and enjoying, uh, you know, the conversations. And um, wherever you are, be well, be safe. Uh, like I say, if there's a loved one close by, give them a hug, give them a kiss. Uh, and also, if you've got friends out there, just give them a, you know, send them a text or call. You don't know what they're going through, like we talked about earlier. And wherever you are, be well. And thank you, Tom. Cook it down, everyone. See you later on tonight. In about, I think, about two hours' time, two and 15 minutes, we've got uh, the Kiwis and Comic Book Show. We've got guests on there. Uh, probably about over 20 year history in comic books in New Zealand as a comic shop owner. And there's a big thing he's involved with worldwide. Uh, we want to discuss that as well as um, talk about Martin Emons, who was like, uh, who was, you know, an icon of New Zealand comics, worked with Simon Beasley worked with 2018 uh, was part of the, uh, working on Lobo, you know, the new character that they're going to make a movie out of over at DC. And all that was through, you know, with working with Simon Beasley with all that. And I think it was Pat Mills who designed Lobo. I'm not sure, but um, thank you. Thanks Tom. Sure right, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Take you later. Bye Ross. And I've been waiting for the noise to die down. So I could have some time to think Think back to when I wanted to be where I am now Free of problems I had then been taking up by more now